Um, and that wonderful reflection about um, you know, the pioneering Sorry. days and the way that we kind of look at our own identity as a nation and as, as pioneers with, with axes as our, as our main tool um, now to um, you know, look at ourselves as, as, as an identity. Our identity is now about um, shovels to plant and buckets to water as, as, as our main tools to, uh, to manage the environment. So it's a, it's a wonderful transition. I'd like to now introduce um, our next speaker, who had the pleasure of, uh, of, of, of enjoying a very um, interesting dinner with last night, um, as, a, as, a, as a bunch of people came together from, from all over the state to, to actually talk about um, the things that we're here to, that, that we're here to talk about. Um, Christine Forster is, is, is both a, a, a farmer and an innovator, in, in my mind, um, involved in, in, water, in water resources and, and, and catchment management. Um, she's been a wool producer for many, many years, um, and also um, through their, their business and their, and their farm, really looking into the new and emerging opportunities that, that exist um, in uh, not only regional development, but also in carbon farming. So some exciting stuff there. Um, and Christine's also been on the board of Big Super for a number of years now, yes. um, contributing in that way to managing the way that, uh, that our futures are looked after through our superannuation as well. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce Christine. Thanks, Ross. And I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land we're meeting on. And I'm going to talk about and share some ideas about how we can manage some of our, our marginal rural land that will probably be challenged in the future with climate change and how we can actually keep, uh, keep people in our rural landscapes. Before I start, I'll give you a quick outline of how I actually came to be where I am. I'm a microbiologist by trade, but many, many years ago in the, uh, in the mid 60s, I went off to the Northern Territory and got involved in water quality before it became fashionable. And in the early 70s, it became fashionable and I went to Canberra and got more into a policy role and, prob and it there exposed to many more of the environmental issues. I was secretary of the Lake Pedder Inquiry and involved in the original work that was that trying to, uh, working on the River Murray and, uh, the, and changing it into the Murray-Darling Basin Authority from the old days when we just worried about water quantity and we didn't worry about quality. In the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s, came back to the farm in Victoria and uh, was involved with the Rural Water Corporation. So my whole, most of my working life has been involved with water, if you like. But in the mid 90s, became involved in the whole catchment management movement. And uh, I became a member of the Cat Victorian Catchment Management Council. And I was chair of that organisation from 2000. And one of the doing jobs of that organisation was to report on the condition and management of Victoria's 10 catchments. Uh, across this rather small state, we have really a wide variety of, of types of catchments and a wide variety of condition of catchments. Over in the east, where there's a lot more water uh, and the geology is different, uh, it, with, there are different challenges. And over here in the west where I live and where we are today, uh, the challenges are dealing with less water and a totally different uh, geology. One of the things when I came back to the farm that I realised was really important was what was happening to the rural landscape and uh, quite early on became involved in a, a range of things to do with, uh, the, with, with regional development and keeping farmers on the land. The, when in, with the Catchment Management Council, when it came to producing the 2002 report, we thought we were just beginning to feel the effects of the millennium drought. We didn't call it that then. We just said it's a, I think we went through phases of saying, don't say drought, you know, say it's a long dry season. Uh, but we were, we, we also did have the advantage by then of see, seeing the predictions of climate change. I mean, I went to my first greenhouse conference in 1988. So by that stage, we were thinking, well, we've got this drought, but you know, it looks like things are going in the wrong direction. When we did that report, we brought together things like uh, demographic trends, farm profit, profitability, land use and valuations, and identified the threats to our soil and water resources and to our biodiversity. 
And what we found in that 2002 report that even though state and federal governments had spent quite a lot of money on uh, do it, protecting and enhancing our land and water resources, we were actually still going backwards. Remember that was the era of the Natural Heritage Trust, the money from Telstra, and we, we did spend a lot of money, but we were going backwards. We, we noted that with a changing climate and de declining terms of trade for our farmers, that uh, we that that we won't be at with the future in the future there'd be tracts of land that wouldn't be able to manage traditional agriculture, and that raised the question for us. We said, well, okay, there's going to be some land that doesn't have uh, have any profitable use by today's standard. Who's going to look after this land? Is it just going to be weeds and rabbits? Uh, because there was a there was a fair a, a fair deal that that would probably happen. And, but we, then we realised that uh, while this land was marginal for, would be marginal for traditional agriculture, it was capable of producing other commodities uh, such as clean water, clean air, uh, salinity mitigation, pollination services, so those bees we need to pollinate the canola crops. Quite often we have to bring them in from somewhere else to do the job. Um, and the, all these ecosystem services, as they were called, were things that we weren't really being valued by the community. And I guess at the time we then saw this was something that we should do, is actually try and bring these, these ecosystem services into the traditional valuation system in our economy. At the time, we were fortunate to have been exposed to the the concept of natural capital that came from the Rocky Mountains Institute that worked so hard in the 90s and still working. And also we were exposed to the work that CSIRO had been doing in this area. There was a little unit beavering away there um, in, uh, in, the, in the early part of this century, to, uh, really working on the concept of ecosystem services and how we might actually bring the value of those into our national accounts. Some of the issues, just quickly, that we were concerned about um, and, the, and how, we, how we might actually, ecosystem services might, a value that might bring this into the future. We, look, we looked particularly at the demographics and Victoria's settlements pattern, and we've talked about that earlier today, and I can remen recommend to you Neil Barr's House on the Hill, which is a very good uh, documentation, if you like, about what's happened in Victoria. I mean, first of all, this area was managed by the uh, indigenous people for probably 40 to 60,000 years and managed quite sustainably. Uh, there was always there, something there for the next generation. In the 19th and 20th century, we became much more densely settled. First of all, in my area around Ararat, the gold rush was the first settlement and every, practically every tree in the place was cut down uh, to either provide fire or, for, or shelter uh, or to prop up the, the mines. Soldier settlement, both in the First and Second World Wars, actually brought more people into the area as well. But in the last 50 or 60 years, it's gone the other way. Our, our regional cities have grown, but our rural towns and our rural communities have been shrinking. And we need to find ways to keep people in these regional communities. Our rivers, um, our rivers were in poor health, especially over this side of the state, um, they, because the, a bit, well, partly because of flow due, due to the long drought, but also just from overuse. Uh, there also, our water quality was poor. And at that time, it came to our attention that uh, the ecosystem services that a healthy river can produce. And I think the classic example that's used a lot is the, um, is the New York water supply, and which comes from the Catskill Mountains. And the catchments of that water supply were very heavily agricultural agricultural-ized, uh, uh, and there were lots of dairy farms and the water was quite polluted. And they were looking at how they were going to uh, actually treat this water supply. And they found out that it would be the tenth of the cost of a traditional treatment plant to, to actually fence off the rivers and protect the riparian area. That would re reduce the pollution enough 
to reduce the cost of treating that water by, by, um, so, by such a large percentage. Uh, the other issue that, of course, we've mentioned already is the whole the issue of climate change. We uh, we were aware, aware back there we did our 2002 report about the increasing greenhouse gases, and we could see the the future there. We could also see that the trees and soil actually can produce a, an ecosystem service for the community by sequestering that carbon. Salinity is another issue for Victoria, both irrigation salinity and dryland salinity. Uh, in dryland, in our area, there's quite a bit of dryland salinity because, as I mentioned earlier, in the gold rush days, they cut down every tree on every hill. Um, and uh, we've now got quite, quite severe dryland salinity in some area. Irrigation salinity is different, but both of those can be managed by ecosystem services. In the case of dryland salinity, it's uh, planting trees in those catchment areas. So you can see you can get quite a bit of bang for your buck, if you like, for, uh, with tree planting in that sort of area. And of course, the other issue which we've talked about is really the, the huge loss of biodiversity that's already happened in Victoria. Where two thirds of our land has been cleared. You know, we like to think of ourselves as a, a green state, and I think we're going in the right direction, but compared to other states in Australia, we've cleared much more land than they have. In the last uh, few years, the federal and state governments have developed market-based instruments to, to, try, to try and actually put a value on some of these ecosystem services and to achieve some sort of improvements in the management of land and water resources. They're all in early stages uh, and some of it can be pretty challenging. Um, some of the examples are ones that um, but Peter and I are involved in at the moment is the Carbon Farming Initiative. Um, we've, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. So there's opportunities there for farmers to sequester carbon in a whole range of ways, by, by changing some practices if you're a dairy farmer, by sequestering uh, carbon in soils if you've got enough rainfall in your area, uh, and by planting trees. The Federal Treasury is developing a system of natural, national, nat national natural accounts that will evaluate the natural capital of Australia alongside um, all our other economic evaluations. And the Wentworth group of scientists have been trialling this for, uh, quite a, for a few years now in a number of catchments across Australia. So I'm looking forward to that first go at uh, national accounts, <coughs> environmental accounts. But one of the real challenges is that the raw data required for many of these accounts, because remember, they've got to match the accounting that we've got. We know how much a dollar is. We wake up every morning and we see how much our dollar is against the United States dollars. We've got to have that, that really tight sort of understanding of what we're doing. Um, and we can only manage things if we can measure it. Um, there's, you can't actually manage something if you haven't got any idea how much of it is or where you want to go. And in, in the water area that I've been involved with most of my life, there's top quality data on the quantity and quality of water. Because water's a scarce resource and we all pay for it in our homes uh, and on our farms if we're irrigators. But things like soil, there is, we really have a paucity of data about our soils and we're in, not in a situation yet where we can actually, um, we haven't measured it enough so that we can manage it properly. The, um, in Victoria, we're getting um, a better idea about managing our biodiversity, you know, but we've still got a long way to go. We still need a lot more data in that sort of area. So I think that's an important message and it's related to your activities, Kate, that um, we, do need to, we, we do need to be able to measure these things if we're going to manage them. Now back home on the farm, there's 800 hectares, Peter and I decided to put some of these ideas into practice. I thought there's not much point in going around talking about these things and got to see uh, you know, how they work out on the farm and what the pitfalls are. So it's been a, quite an interesting journey in the last 20 years. With hindsight and increasing understanding, a lot of our earlier ideas were, our actions were really informed, but we've learned along the way. We came to the farm 30 years ago with the simplistic idea that uh, trees were good, any trees, 
um, that we didn't matter what they are, they just had to be trees. Uh, very early on the piece we had a farming disaster. We lost 200 pregnant ewes um, after shearing on a day in early March when one day was 35 degrees and the next day was 8 degrees. And 200 of our old girls just pa passed away. Well, I won't go into the details of what we, how we tried to keep them going, but it was, it was pretty tragic. <laughs> um, it's the sort of day when the Met Bureau says it's a sheep farmer's weather alert, and it certainly is a sheep farmer's weather alert in, the, in those days. So we paid homage to those dead girls by planting shelter belts of pines and cypresses on our volcanic plains. And we thought we were doing the right things. Trees are good. Peter's always been a birdo, but we didn't have many on the farm except a few chats and the raptors that lived on the mice and rabbits. We and we started to absorb messages about native plantations to encourage bird life and we planted native trees, native to Western Australia and New South Wales, of course. That's what was available. And we've, we've, we actually found, uh, found a tree list today that we used back in those times. And um, so we've, we've, but we've learnt a lot as we've gone. We, we've, um, we've got 25 per cent of the farm um, doing the job of eco creating ecosystem services now. Um, we've got all our waterways have been fenced and revegetated. We bought 200 hectares of rocks and rabbits, you know, that had been cleared in the gold rush days to uh, expand our ecosystem empire. And it's, we're specialising in biodiversity, salinity mitigation, because it actually saves salt coming into this Wimmera catchment, and carbon sequestration. We've signed up for the Carbon Farming Initiative and we're this in, next week probably putting in 23 hectares of granitic hills grassy woodland EVC. And we expect to get a moderate flow of revenue from this marginal land to help us manage it into perpetuity. So back to the, uh, our VCMC findings. Valuing our ecosystem services and internalising our natural capital costs into our economic structure will provide an opportunity to manage these marginal lands for an uncertain future. It will also provide jobs in regional areas and keep people in our rural landscapes. I do have a vision for that future. We'll be managing our rural landscapes, not only for the production of food and fibre, but also for the production of the ecosystem services that are essential if we're to prosper in this delicately balanced biosphere we inhabit. Thank you very much, Christine. Now we probably have time for just uh, one question, I think, for, for Christine on ecosystem services or something related. At the back there, yes. Oh, just on your, your last point there about this very delicate biosphere that we live in, is um, we're talking a lot about sustainability today. Yes. Um, and there's some ideas that have been put forward, but really, um, I would also like um, the concept of resilience built into there as well, because we can talk about sustainable ecosystems and ecosystem services and growing canola in amongst the trees, which isn't really practical, and red gum limbs falling isn't really practical in the long term. We've got uh, you know, huge demands being made on our environment, and, um, and they're going to put pressures on which are going to demand resilience as well, and that concept that's discussed in some forms, but not always when it comes to sustainability. No, and I think you might be hearing more about resilience later on today too. No, I, I totally agree. And I guess that's the important thing is that we do need complexity in our environment. One of the things that we've done over the years that made it more and more simple and uh, removed some of the complexity from our environment that provided us with, uh, with that, that resilience. And I think resilience has to be in our mind into the future, both for the environment and for the people that are in the rural landscape. So we've got, we, I totally agree with you, resilience is an important concept. Absolutely important point. Ladies and gentlemen, please uh, welcome me in, in, uh, in thanking Christine Foster. <laughs> Thank you, Christine. And again, we're going to do a little microphone, um, a bit of uh, shuffling around there as we. Um,